Okay, welcome to, um, everybody to the second to last Democratic Marxism lecture for 2018. I'm Michelle Williams. I'm one of the co-organizers of this series. Um, I just want to quickly say Manlan Humphe is still coming. He's coming from Victoria and hit traffic. So he should be here within 10 minutes. He's very close. Uh, and Ronnie Castro has had some health issues this week and had to have um, a little procedure done, so is not coming. He was hoping, he, he kept open the possibility till this afternoon and he's not able to come. Okay, um, I wanted to start with uh, a moment of silence. It was on this day in 2012 that 34 mine workers were shot down in Americana and their families and the workers I think around Americana workers from everywhere in the country are still waiting for justice. So I thought we could take a moment of silence for the um, Maracana victims. To, while I'm on the sad note, I'll do it all at once. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the passing of one of the towering political economists slash Marxists from our continent. Samir Amin passed away a couple days ago. Um, his work on anti-imperialism at, and um, at the set, which was anti-imperialism at the center of his analysis, and he provided innovative alternative approaches to national and international development. So we've lost another towering figure. This year, actually, we've lost quite a few on the, the Marxist left. We also lost Omar Altwalter, who brought ecology to the center of Marxist analysis. And we also lost Paul Singer and Marco Aurelio, two of the leading thinkers of the left workers' party in Brazil. All of them have passed in the last few months. So I think a whole generation that we've all been the only spending, many of us have been um, profoundly informed by and um, have looked to are gone. But I'm happy to say we have a new generation coming to the fore. Um, some of us not so new, some newer than others. So it's wonderful that tonight's lecture is part of our two Marxist 200th celebration. Um, we've had several events this year to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Marx's birth, and this is one of those. You will see on our poster um, a few announcements. The one with Coltar, that was supposed to be, I think, next week or the week after, one of the problems when you get older, you start having health problems. He had to have a knee replacement surgery, and so can't fly. So we postponed that now till February or early March. I can't remember, but it's going to be early 2019. Um, we also, the one on October 3rd, Racism Against Apartheid, is being postponed because the book, the Vince Press will only get the book out on at the very beginning of 2019. So we'll have that one as well, early 2019. There's no point to have that conversation unless we have that book because a lot of it is around that book. Okay, but I'm happy to say we are still having the series on 19th September, which will be on Marxism and the state. And I think as we're facing more and more fascist governments, I just came from Brazil, which is I think really decidedly headed, heading into a fascist period. I think discussions around the state are more and more important today and democracy as well. I want to um, also start uh, um, specifically mention that this entire series is made possible by the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Both of them have provided support to bringing people like Coltar and others, Pindi from Cape Town, others into these programs. So thank you to their funders. Um, so let me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each one of them right now, and then um, I won't introduce them in between. We'll go straight from one to the other. Because a Pindi, a Pindile, um, holds a master's in history from Vitz. She's at home. Her research variously explored the history of the local state in South Africa, youth political activism, apartheid forms of co-optation, and youth political demobilization. She has also explored post-apartheid forms of reper and repertoires of collective action and protest. An activist herself, she has been involved in youth and student movements, trade unions, and currently works as an educator and curriculum specialist um, in the service of activist organizations at the Chitsamani Center for Activist Education. So we're delighted to have Indy with us tonight. Devon Pillay um, is a former political prisoner who became activist in student and media politics in the 1970s and 1980s. Before finishing his PhD on trade unions and politics, 
with Harold Wolpe in 1989. He worked for the South African Labor Bulletin, worked in progress journals. The younger ones might not know about Work in Progress, but it was one of the most important journals of the 90s. Um, or only, only those diehard political activists or politicos would know about Work in Progress, but it's a, it was a fantastic journal. And Devin was one of the editors, one of the um, I think first editors of it. Um, he also worked as a trade genius for NUM and in government and has been for the last, I think, close to 20 years in academia. He currently heads the sociology department at FITS and is active in the Global Labor University Network. Mona Nkompe, who is the one late from Pretoria that he'll be here in a few minutes, is a member of the ANC, a deputy chair of the Amon, um, um, Ahmed Katrada Foundation, and a special advisor to the Minister of Public Enterprises. He's also the, chair, uh, the chairperson of Future South Africa. And Vishwa Satka has been an activist for over three decades. He was a community youth and student activist in the 80s in the Natal Indian Congress and the UDF. Trained in labor law, he worked for Kasatu's think tank Naledi for five years on labor market reform in the mid-1990s. He was expelled from the South African Communist Party in 2009 for his stand against unification. He is the co-founder of the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center, the Solidarity Economy Movement Network, the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, the Wakani City Kwe Campaign, Zuma Must Go Campaign, SOSNET, Trade Union Education through Vitz Social Theory, and I think the list goes on, but that's all I'm naming. He is the editor of the Democratic Marxism book series. Fish, can you hold up the book? That's the third volume, and we're waiting for the fourth one, which is on uh, Marxism Against Racism. Um, he, and he's an associate professor in international relations. So what I plan to do, I'm a very strict chair, so I'm going to give, we've agreed, all of us, that they're going to have 15 minutes each, and after that I'll have them all speak, and then we'll open it up for a conversation, a collective conversation at the end. And we'll end by seven, because I know that's what we said we would do. Okay, thank you. Do you want to sit there or do you want to? Um, I don't know. Am I audible? Can I speak? Can you hear her? Is it a problem for recording? Is, can you hear her or do you want her up here? Up there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Poor thing. She eight months pregnant <laughs> and standing up here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's funny. Yeah, I'm very, very pregnant. But let's see. Um, is it I'll be fine. I, I think it will keep me disciplined to stick to my. <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so, oh, okay, so where do I start? I mean, I, when I looked at the topic, I thought one of the, the things to do um, when you ask the question about Karl Marx and Marxism in South Africa, what are the prospects, the future, and all of those things, is to maybe when we talk about the future, to start, um, I know maybe older people who want to go to the past, but I prefer to maybe speak about the present. Um, in, as an entry point into, into thinking about the future. And so, what I thought was that, I mean, when, you, when, when my own cursory analysis, and it may be limited, a cursory analysis of the 21st century African political scene seems to suggest that even though the continent has been anything but silent politically, Political expressions associated with Marxism seem to be very marginal or on the margins of, of popular struggles. And you're welcome to, to take this argument on and to contest it and all of that. But I'm arguing that from young people who are involved currently as we speak in struggles against despotism, electoral flaw, fraud, manipulation of constitutions, repression, unemployment, privatization, environmental degradation and corruption, Marxism hardly, hardly features or hardly serves as a clue that sort of holds some of these movements that we've seen popping up everywhere from Myanmar, um, in Senegal, from the movements in Togo, from various other places. Um, one struggles to find political expressions that are ostensibly um, Marxist. Instead, people are sourcing um, yeah, political expressions from, from other places, which I found very interesting. I think this is so pronounced that some commentators also suggest that the 20th century, unlike the 20th century, uh, where variants of Marxism inspired anti-colonial struggles, state building or regime crafting exercises, um, 
today we see a very different picture. So that's sort of like my starting point. And of course there are a variety of reasons that are tabled for this and maybe many of us know about um, some of these reasons, but I'll just list a few. Um, one of these reasons is, well, perhaps this retreat of Marxism from the continent is, can be traced back to the global retreat of Marxism from, yeah, from the world stage, basically. And people cite 1989, people cite 1991, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and so forth. Other people also speak about the less than satisfactory record of post-independence regimes that actually describe themselves as uh, Marxist Leninists and all of those things. So they associate the retreat with the flaws of some of those, those regimes without going into a lot of detail on that. But also, others also argue, uh, argue and say that um, this is part of the story about how Marxism was incorporated as part of the ideological weaponry of the post-colonial um, ruling elite in some ways. So, so that's sort of the record and that's sort of the argument about why Marxism seems to be on the margins of popular struggles in, on the African continent today. But I want to come a little, a little bit more to the South African context because when one looks at least at organized movements, at mass movements, we don't seem to be having a scarcity of organizations that in one way or another describe themselves as Marx is this, Marx is Lenin is that, and all of those things. So when you look at the YCL, the SACP, the EFF, the unions, and all of that, in the constitutions, the policy documents, and all of that, you're likely to find some reference um, or another to, to, to Marxism. As to what sort of Marxism is practiced, um, what sort of Marxism is practiced in those political spaces, that's a debate for another day. But I want to argue that even, even, even with that situation, or this particular situation where Marxism is not um, scarce in, 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 in mass political movements in South Africa today, we do have a, a generation of young people who are up and coming today who actually do not subscribe to Marxism, even though they hold or they subscribe to an anti-capitalist politics. And that's sort of my interest um, in a way. And what I'm going to be doing today is to maybe reflect a little bit um, from, based, reflect on my interactions with some of the members of this particular generation, what their apprehensions are, what their reservations with, with regards to Marxism are, and then and then see whether we can draw some conclusions um, in the seminar and see whether we can, maybe we'll have some contestations around some of the reasons that are listed um, by these young people. Sorry. So one of the things about being this pregnant is that you run out of breath very quickly, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, so so, so I, I want to ask the question, why is this the case and why is Marxism falling out of favor, particularly with yeah, a generation of young people who are entering the political terrain? And I don't mean to, to talk in, um, in, in broad terms, so you'll just, you'll just bear with me. To explain this, I'm going to list about three reasons. It's not an exhaustive list, but let's see if we, it, it, it gets us some way. The first um, reason I want to pose as a question, and this question is, could it be that part of Marxism's loss of purchase among young activists today is linked to how Marxism became instrumental instrumentalized by a post-apartheid political elite? So, so that's the question I'm asking. Is that question clear? Right? So I'm asking whether the question, I'm, I'm asking whether Marxism is falling out of favor because maybe Marxism has been recruited um, as part of the ideological justification of a post-apartheid political elite. And I've got a number of examples to draw from, but without painting the SACP, uh, Vish and Zico, in, um, as a monolith and without dismissing its um, internal contradictions, I think it's important to consider how the ascendance and incorporation of the senior party cadre in the state post-1994 till today and the evident absence of a radical agenda therein has led to, the, to a form of cynicism about the SACP's politics and perhaps by, by extension about Marxism 
and how this actually became even more pronounced um, in the recent past with, with the Zuma administration. So many of the people who are active in the student movement, who have been active in the student movement, different generations, would also know how, I mean, it, it, it's not a classic example, example, but one of the examples is how the Minister of Higher Education at the time, David Zimanda, actually locked horns with students around, around um, free education, and many of us actually do have some arguments about how yeah, the radical agenda was not pushed far enough, and in actual fact, as someone who comes from the party, he was a little bit conservative um, in that particular space. There are a number of examples that one could also cite. I, I like this one about Tula Zimanis, who was also a leading member of the party, who actually went out and justified the corruption in Gaza, and as a result, nobody takes him seriously today. So, I mean, it's a long list of examples that we could sort of use um, to, in, in, in response to, to this question. But I think to this one might add the increased bureaucratization of unions, who also sub subscribe right, to a form of Marxism, or describe themselves as such, and how they have become defined by big men with bodyguards and multi-million red houses, and the big men who abuse organizational power, who sexually prey on women, and lead lives that are very distant from the rank and file or the very people that they lead. Um, there is also something to be said about how some Marxists have also presided over regressive university decisions way back that we are still, I mean, whose consequences we are still fighting to this day. So to sum it up, um, this reason number one is, is I, I can sum it up with a question, is there any val validity to the claim that Marxism has become part of the politics of the establishment. Um, as to what form of Marxism, that's another question altogether, and I'd like us to actually delve deeper into that. Now, to go, go to the second question, or the second reason. And that second reason is that a popular, and I'm drawing this specific, this specific reason from a Marx 200, the bicentennial, celebrations that we had at Chisimani where we went through six weeks of studying the Communist Manifesto and then we had a five-day camp um, called Marx in Africa that drew from young people from PASMA, EFF, YCL, um, other social movements like equal education and all of that. And, and so the second reason is like a popular and often, often repeated critique of Marxism today is that it pays insufficient attention to race um, and that it conceives of a revolutionary subject that is white, that is male, and that is European. Right? That's what you're mostly like, likely to hear when you speak uh, to sections of young politicized people today who subscribe to an anti capitalist politics. So I would say that we know now, um, or we've known for some time, that this is devoid of historical fact. But given its recurrence and acceptance as an article of faith, it is perhaps not useful to simply talk of maybe Kevin Anderson and cite Kevin Anderson and how Kevin Anderson actually rediscovered or um, reintroduced or introduced Marxist evolution um, in terms of his worldview on non-Western societies and so on and so forth. I'm arguing that it's, it's maybe not sufficient to just do that. And maybe it's also not sufficient or enough to weed out Marxist, Marxist traditions that sprung <laughs> up from anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggles of the 20th century. So you can't just bring out Roy or Sierra James and so on and so forth and say, this question is done and dusted. We've answered this question. And the reason why I'm saying that is that in today's context, it is important to go beyond this because one, we see deepening divisions and enmity between and within sections of the working class in South Africa today. I only have to say, Things like maybe Khatfol, Cape Town, and um, how sections of the working class, the colored and the African working class in parts of the country, are actually at each other's throats um, in some ways. So, I mean, there is a particular form of race politics that is developing there that is actually quite damaging um, to working class politics. So, you can't just ignore that question and say it was settled in history. We must talk about what's happening today. And I also think that the rise of an exclusionary nationalism that thrives on race essentialism, that appeals to narrow black solidarity, um, uh, xenophobia and hate, uh, forces us to, to actually take this particular critique quite, quite seriously. 
And so this is a particular challenge to Marxism because not only do shortcut political strategies, and we've seen them in full display in South Africa um, in the recent past, not only do these strategies rely on the, on the devices of division, but because these politics actually do have some patches in working class communities, partly because people are so pushed against the wall, and when people are pushed against the wall, it's not always a radical politics that is born out of those conditions. So the challenge on Marxism's doorstep is that of weaving a radical race politics that unites the biggest losers out of the consolidation of capitalist power, or the power of capital in South Africa and post-apartheid South Africa. And this demands, I think, a concrete understanding of how the erosion of living standards in the urban and the rural areas has actually provided a very fertile ground for these types of politics. And I think that the left, the Marxist left's fortunes are intricately tied to how we approach some of these questions and there are no easy answers. Things have shifted and have changed quite drastically in the last 24 years that we can't assume that the bureaucratization that was done or the making, the coming into being of the working class in South Africa still suffices today. Um, and I'll go into detail maybe when we, when we do a Q&A. A third and last aspect of, of the reasons, I think there is something to be said about how Marxism engages with the politics of everyday life. In the past, it was easy to set a rights-based approach to struggle, um, meaning uh, people who would use things like the South African Constitution to lay claims on the state and to fight whether that's for health, education, etc. So it was quite easy to set this particular approach against what some call a counter-hegemonic or an explicitly anti-capitalist approach to struggle. From this point, one could proceed with dismissing the right, rights-based struggles as reformist, as hopeless, even when some of the victories recorded actually do place capital on the back foot. But I think our times, in some ways, demand that we push such politics aside because they haven't really been, um, been helpful. And I think we need to push them aside and prioritize a politics that builds bridges. And by this I mean that a politics that brings the revolutionary subjects together. And there's still a question about who is the revolutionary subject in South Africa today that we could possibly talk a little bit about. But a politics that also appreciates how different struggles intersect, how people come into political action and what motivates them. And a politics that also goes beyond um, the big moments or the big explosion, a politics that takes the everyday struggles very seriously. And linked to this is a need to ask ourselves whether the preoccupation with political parties, as important as they are, because political power is important and contesting the state is important, but to ask ourselves whether this preoccupation with political parties and the electoral terrain is really doing us any good. And I'm saying this because we are also approaching 2019 and already um, when we speak about the political instruments, there already talks about how yet another revolutionary party might feature or might be buying for space um, on the electoral ballot. So I think that's something important to consider. Um, in conclusion, when I was organizing just my thoughts around this seminar, I found Michael Burewe's Trinity on Marxism's potency very useful, and what he basically says is that, well, there are three things really about Marxism. One is its critique of capitalism, or what he calls objectivity. The second is about resistance, um, what he calls engagement. And I think those two things are very important. The third one, however, I think is, is critically important for our times, and I think that's what he calls imagination, the ability to actually think about the world beyond what we have right now. And I think um, the resilience of Marxism in South Africa will be tested in that terrain because not only do we have to critique and continuously study the system or to resist it, but I, I do think that visions of alternatives um, can breathe hope into, into our politics. We do have a, a new generation that is testing its strength, experimenting and posing new questions. Um, and I think a politics that lacks imagination, possibility and openness will probably not attract its attention or its affections. Um, so I'll end there. Thanks.
is exactly 15 minutes. Very exciting. Devin, look at. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Michelle, uh, and thanks, Speedy. That was uh, very stimulating. A lot of thought-provoking issues there. I actually don't feel like speaking now because you raised so many uh, critical issues of our time that I wanted rather go back. It's more comfortable to reflect backwards. You reflect from the, the current space of today. Um, which is exceptionally challenging because all the things that we as young activists in the 70s and 80s, um, things we thought we had left behind, narrow nationalism, um, uh, the politics of, um, uh, of reaction, etc. It's just coming to the fore with such a force that we, we, we've been caught off guard in the sense of the past <coughs> few years. So let me go back. I want to wave a book around because I just love this book so much. Uh, it's just come out this year. It's, it's thick, but it's very readable. Uh, it's called A World to Win the Life and Works of Karl Marx by a Swedish author, um, Sven Erik Liebman, published by Versa Press. I really recommend you buy this. If there's any, if you've not, none of you have read a biography of Marx, this is the one to read. Because, I'll tell you why it's important, it's not just another biography of Marx. You know, Marx, many people have written about Marx over the years, but they had to rely on certain bodies, or bodies of his work that came out in drips and drabs. Lenin, for example, only had access to a tiny percentage of his work, and he wrote about Marx, Trotsky, etc. Um, then you had uh, the so-called Western Marxism had access to more, like the Grundrisse and others, and came up with further insights and tried to revive the, revive the humanistic aspects of Marx. Others like Arthur came back and reasserted structuralist Marxism, etc. Um, what has happened now over the past few decades, and it's a continuing project, is that um, all of Marx's work has been gathered together. Um, and this guy has read everything, <laughs> right? So this is like the up-to-date version, but he combines that the theory, uh, integrates that into the life story, and it's really, really well done. Um, and the one thing that I got from this, now you, 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 you would have heard of the critiques, right? Is a democratic Marxism perspective, which some of us uh, uh, feel close to, um, which we feel is that it tries to get back to the dialectic, or what we call the dialectical essence of Marx and the humanist and democratic dimensions of Marx. And in doing that, there might be an appreciation of Lenin, but also a critique of Lenin or Leninism, right? Uh, as Prindy mentioned. Um, the fact that Leninist regimes in power have been very brutal, undemocratic regimes. And so Leninism, Marxist Leninism has become associated with Stalinism, although people who want to make a separation, Trotskyists want to separate themselves from that. Um, but nevertheless, organization like the ANC. In other words, what has been the impact of Marx and Marxism in the, in the ANC as it were? And I think like the other speakers have indicated, I think for many of us, Marxism has always been a, an animating idea, an, an idea that uh, propelled us uh, to actions uh, in, in, in many ways. But there are questions that uh, we're going to have to uh, look at whether this trend within the ANC uh, has run its course and uh, whether the ANC has turned its back on this trend, which is Marxism in, in broader terms as, as it were. 
There is no doubt that uh, the history and existence of the ANC as a quintessential force for liberation uh, cannot be ignored. Because uh, I think it was uh, at the head of uh, major struggles of the 20th century. Anti-apartheid uh, struggle was a major struggle up across the globe and the ANC was uh, at the center of uh, that struggle uh, in, in general. And that struggle in itself um, was, uh, was quite big. <coughs> so the ANC itself would not uh, escape the influences of the economic challenges, the political challenges of South Africa and abroad, particularly post uh, Second World War uh, as such. So that's one area that I wanted to check. The second one, I think it's important to also raise the idea that uh, the ANC is a nationalist movement itself was defined in time by tenets of uh, modernity and enlightenment, which I'm going to come back to, and universal values uh, in particular, universal values that transcend uh, racial, ethnic, geographic chauvinism, and propounding non-racialism, uh, united South Africa, non-sexism, and equality in general. And those are, in my view, modernist uh, notions of uh, in, in, in general but those also would be to a greater extent have been rooted in what i call in the liberalism of the earlier uh, period the founders of the anc who wanted to mimic uh, the british uh, empire and who wanted to also claim uh, their place in equality and, and, and all that so that's one on, on, on the one hand but on the other hand, I think it's very material to say, to talk about post-World War II anti-colonial uh, struggles, which in many instances themselves were uh, modernist, etc. But the important insertion uh, in this regard for me is uh, the, what I call the gradual conservation of the relationship between the ANC, the Communist Party, the trade union uh, movement, which in a way paved the way for a much more progressive and deeper perspective on how you push the boundaries because hitherto it would have been a, a liberal conception uh, in, in general and i think that liberal conception moved on up until the 60s uh, 70s um, uh, coming from uh, this uh, part of events and, uh, and other institutions as, as it were but the, the issue i'm raising here is that uh, being part of the modernist and enlightenment and actually the socialist element that came into actually broadened uh, the, the conceptions of the ANC as such. So that's all. The second broad area on, on Marx and, and Marxism in, in South Africa uh, as such. Now, I think we all know the history of uh, South Africa, capitalist exp expansion, colonial conquest and domination. And that, for me, uh, rendered Marxism an interesting and a very effective idea in terms of the critique. Um, so I'm just going to throw in concepts of race uh, that we have to deal with, the issues of uh, exploitation, the issues of uh, super exploitation, which is undergirded by cheap labor uh, system, the different modes of production and all that. These are the things that I think were dominant in the uh, 60s and mainly in the, in the 70s, etc. The point that I want to raise two points about uh, Marxism that I think help the, the liberation movement. Its potency for me lay in its ability to, 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 to frame or to analyze uh, actually existing capitalism uh, at the time. So its explanatory power, I think it's, I, I don't know of any other ideas that are able to explain uh, issues like uh, Marxism. So the explanatory power for me it's a, it's a very important uh, issue. The second one, now being militants of the liberation movement, sometimes not given to contemplative uh, philosophy and, 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 and idealistic notion of uh, progress and all that, is the idea of change. And, and, and that is where I bring in uh, I was asking uh, how do you pronounce Faber uh, in the 11th uh, thesis. And remember, 
that 11th thesis which says philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. So that's, that's the main point, which I think governs almost uh, uh, everybody. So there's theory, but there is action uh, uh, as such. And for me, therein lay the strength and the potence of uh, Marxism uh, as, as such. And in that sense, uh, for militants and revolutionaries, uh, it became important because we were able to get insight into the system but, and how to change the system for humanity as such. I, I don't think Marx and Marxism cannot, can be seen outside the Enlightenment uh, project and uh, maybe more than any but Enlightenment project because it's a project that goes back to Kant, uh, goes back to uh, Hegel but Marx and his uh, fellow revolutionaries uh, tend uh, that uh, around. But the issue there is, I think, uh, so that we don't think about South Africa in a very short term way, is the idea of human emancipation. So Devin uh, adds, uh, what holistic? Uh, I'm still uh, with uh, the, the other guys there. So, but the idea is to expand human uh, uh, franchises of freedom, uh, as it were. So that whatever democratic struggle we, we, we have here, or et, et cetera, but it's about emancipation of uh, human beings. Uh, I have a, a, a definition from Marx, which I'm not going to uh, talk about. And then the third area, uh, Chair, it's more about uh, so Marxism and the left in South Africa. And I think it's important to say that uh, the left, as a political and philosophical outlook is not a single uh, phenomenon, uh, particularly also in our country. It is made up of various strands who have vied for leadership uh, place in the political discourse, theoretically, ideologically, and, and, and all that. So, South Africa has a long tradition of uh, left politics, so that you don't only <coughs> see it narrowly in terms of the ANC and the Communist Party. Um, so there would be, uh, Devin has spoken about anarchists, about uh, syndicalist uh, groupings, the trust guides, um, black consciousness movement in, in the latter days and, and all that. But in short, Marxism for me became a vital and a, a, vibrant, a vibrant alternative to the liberal and narrow nationalist discourses. <coughs> Particularly in uh, now in the 40s, uh, in the 40s, there's uh, this idea of the new African, <coughs> uh, the and uh, the Mandelas and, and all that. new Africans, really educated folks and, and all that, uh, good. But the issue there, I think, it helped us to uh, push quite a, a, a lot of things. So Muslim, I think, for me, helped us to uh, to deal with that. Now, in whatever way you want to. Tag, uh, Marxism, Leninism, or, or something like that. But I think there's a contribution that we have to acknowledge that South Africa, through maybe the do dominant discourse, has made in, in the world of Marxism. And that is the issue of uh, uh, the colonialism of a special type, rising from the Black uh, Republic uh, thesis, uh, as it were. And that is a basis on which what has come to be called an NDR has, has to be effect effective. Uh, and all that. So there is a reality of the ANC which I've uh, actually uh, s s spoken about. Um, now, the ANC is, is, is an interesting organization because it being a nationalist movement, but at the same time has got these tools which uh, in some ways is religion, it's dogma, uh, <laughs> tools of analysis, which is uh, Marxism, Leninism, and, 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 and all that. But they are left nonetheless. Um, but the, the issue there is that you would have people talking about dialectical materialism, historical materialism, the theory of uh, knowledge and everything that maybe came from Comintern and all that, on the one hand. But at the same time do something very opposite. Uh, that. So, so maybe these are the, the, the dilemmas of our times and, and all that. Now, towards the end, Basically, to, to say there are things that we have learned from uh, Marx and the concepts 
And I don't think it's time to deal uh, move them away. It's to actually reclaim. So, for instance, this idea of uh, the national question, in the ANC we call it the national question. Uh, it's, it's, on, it's receding now. Nationalists are, are moving on. And non nationalism is moving back and, and, and all that. So, it, I, I think it's, it's about time that we confront that issue uh, as we talk. The other one is the issue of class as a category. Now, in recent times, I don't know, maybe it's because of, uh, as a, as a instance of post-modernity, identity politics. But my view is that uh, we need to bring back the issue of class, the issue of gender is one issue, the issue of uh, uh, environment and, and climate as such. I think my colleagues have also raised the issue, which is a critique on Marxism generally. I don't think we've done well in so far as power is concerned political power. Um, where we've done, I think we've, we've done a, a bad job. Uh, so, but we are not known to, to have done quite a, a very good things. Then, on the relevance of Marxism today in South Africa, for me, as long as capitalism exists, I think there is a, a relevance for Marxism in, in South Africa. The, the fault lines in our national lives remain, which is economic injustice, uh, colonialism, which is a national question, gender, climate, etc. But the issue, I think for me, is understanding contemporary capitalism, because it's not the same as earlier capitalism. Now, I don't think, I think we are in a space in South Africa where, I don't know, we're very far from what's happening in the world. We, we're not grappling with the nature of capital as it exists today. It's the different modes of uh, existence and, and all that. So that's for me, it, 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 it's a very important issue. And what does it mean to have to contribute as global south to, to, to Marxism uh, as, as it were? What is the future for the left? First of all, we have to define what is the left. Now, the purest amongst us will define it in a very small way in the corner there as Marxist Leninist, as uh, this and that and that. But I need, we need to revisit that in terms of what is it that uh, constituted the left as, as it were. There are issues there. For instance, I think I hear this day to talk about democratic socialism. It's very important. Non-sectarian politics, very important. Building of the uh, movement of the working class very important. Tactical alliance is, so far as social justice uh, is concerned. <coughs> I think we have lost that. Maybe I'm in the ANC and the government. So I don't get a sense of the internationalism. Uh, but the international persp internationalist perspective of our struggles uh, in general is <coughs> very useful. But because we're also in the continent, understanding the post colonial state and its undemocratic uh, impulses and the political economy that underpins that uh, post-colony, uh, as, as it were. It's very important, I think, uh, to also not think in sectional terms. And I think somebody, maybe the syndicalist will say, the working class must be the vanguard. But whose responsibility is to fight for national purpose, uh, for national interests, in, and, and bring a, a coalition of groupings, etc. And I don't think we've done that very well in the South African uh, left. I think we're in, a, in our own uh, small corner there. I think uh, it could be Pindi who, who, who raised the question. I, I raised the question again. Can the left pursue its objective through a single political expression? Or do we have a broader sense of uh, the left uh, uh, as, as it were? Contemporary, I've I, I spoken human emancipation as such. And, uh, but also, I think because we are active participants in the, in the revolution. Yeah? For instance, let's take theory of imperialism. It can't be that it ended up with Lenin. And today we can't theorize around uh, imperialism, its mode of existence uh, today, etc. The idea of the national democratic, uh, coming from the ANC, you know, uh, national democratic revolution, is it still relevant? Is it helpful? Or are these things fetters or they block us from our free conception of uh, 
what needs to be done. Otherwise, we got get back down, back down like hey, it's, it's a religion as, as it were. So in that sense, I think we'll be able to build what I think you're saying is counter hegemonic uh, alliances, <coughs> but not counter hegemonic alliances in small corners and all that. <coughs> but in real struggle, power is also a very important uh, issue to transform people's lives. Thank you. because I actually agree with a lot of what she says, but take it in a slightly different direction and then try and speak to maybe three or four points. Um, the short uh, question that was posed in our poster was, you know, Karl Marx and South African Marxism, is it over? And I think our starting point is that a form of official Marxism is in crisis. And I think this is where I fully agree with Pindi and for all the reasons she cites. Um, appropriation by a ruling elite, um, a, a Marxism that doesn't speak to the everyday, and so on. And I think it's in that context that we have embarked on this project, the Democratic Marxism Project, as a counterpoint, if you like, to this jaded, ossified, authoritarian Marxism, Leninism that has lost its way. And what are we trying to do with this project? Well, we are trying to develop uh, the theoretical resources of Marxism, historical Marxism. We are trying to do conjunctural analysis. So we're trying to understand what's happening in the world, what forces are shaping the world today, and so on. The third thing we are trying to do with this is actually, um, um, if you like, have a dialogue with those that are against the grain of Marxism. So it's not just Marxists that have been writing for the Democratic Marxism series. It's those that also stand against. So there's a very creative tension in that conversation. And I think the last thing we're trying to do here is connect with the impulse of left praxis. We have had young people from Occupy Wall Street contribute to our series. We've had young people involved with food sovereignty campaigning, climate justice campaigning, solidarity economy movement building, and so on. So in a sense, this is one response to the crisis. It may not be the perfect response, it may not be the complete response, but it's there. I put my notes on my phone, so I have, stress. I have difficulties <laughs> reading. <coughs> the other point about this is that um, it's very distinctive from three other important projects in the world. We have the Socialist Register, which is a very, very important contribution, which is about conjunctural analysis. Uh, we have the monthly review coming out of uh, the US, and that's really a particular school of Marxism, a monopoly finance capital approach. And then, of course, there's subaltern studies, uh, which emerged in India and used the Gramscian approach to develop, if you like, histories from below and theory and so on. So, in a sense, this is us, in a modest way, in the South African context, trying to break new ground. Uh, and I think in that sense, uh, trying in some way to address some of the concerns that, that Pindi is raising. So because I don't think we can generalize about Marxism, and I think there are spaces to be claimed. Now to make a few quick points. Um, the first point is actually about thinking about Marx today as an anti-racist. And to really think about that in relation to what has been said, uh, you know, particularly Mandla spoke about the theorization, the theoretical analysis we've had of apartheid and capitalism in South Africa has been powerful in explanatory terms. These are Marxist theories, so whether they articulations of modes of production, whether they are racial capitalism, whether they are colonialism of the special type, these theories have been very, very crucial, but they've traveled, they've evolved, they've developed as Marxist theories. So the question is, how does this relate to Marx? And that's the point I want to register here today. That there's actually a connection in Marx's thinking and practice. These theories have, if you like, a lineage. Okay? So for example, if you look at the idea of primitive accumulation in Marx, the, 
the, the original moment, originary moment of capitalist development, where there is, if you like, a role for pre-capitalist social relations, where there is racism, Africa is a warren of black skins, where there is slavery, etc. That kind of perspective has opened up a way to think about racial capitalism in South Africa. That approach, that, that, that thinking about capitalism has also helped us think about articulations of modes of production with pre-capitalist relations of production. The other thing in Marx was that Marx realized initially he had a, if you like, an epistemological Eurocentricism. He believed that the European standard was the standard for development, for the march of modernity and progress and so on. But actually he goes beyond that. Okay? And Actually, what you find in Marx is a, is a very serious critique of colonialism, a critique of the deleterious impacts of colonialism. Uh, it's, Marx was a very vocal um, abolitionist vis-à-vis -vis slavery. Okay? It's there in his writings, his journalistic writings, and so on. Marx is very vocal in terms of national oppressions, etc., that come with imperialism and colonialism, and so on. So, Coming out of that lineage also is a connection with colonialism of a special type in South Africa. There is a, a reach back into Marx. So if we were anti-racist, evoking these theories, they have a connection with Marx. The final point I'll make about this is that the anti-racism that we practice in South Africa as part of anti-apartheid resistance also connects with Marx's own anti-racism in his time. And this was him if you like, standing up against racism in his world, in, in his society, and so on. So that's the, the first point I want to make. And, and, and maybe, of course, you know, these theoretical frameworks that we have, etc., may not have fully broken with Eurocentric modernity, particularly industrial-scale violence, exploitation, violence, ethno-nationalism, alienation, and ecological destructiveness particularly in their the conceptions of socialism. So does the Freedom Charter, for example, break with a Eurocentric modernity? Does the minimum program of Trotskyism break with a Eurocentric uh, modernity? I think these are the deeper, deeper questions we have to grapple with. And Samir Amin gives us some guidance on this journey as well, uh, the late Samir Amin in his book, uh, Eurocentrism. The second point I want to make is this. Marx gave us a sense of the requirements of capitalist accumulation in capital, published in 1867. Samir Amin, in his general historical materialist analysis, suggests contemporary capitalism is obsolete. But if we look closely at the conjuncture today of neoliberal crisis and resistance, there's something new that characterizes it. Now, we know that neoliberalism is a class project. We know it's about financialized. Uh, capitalist accumulation, we know it's about reproducing the power of the U.S. and corporations, we know it's about precarious labor, we know it's about undermining unions, and we know it's about pushing the collapse of ecosystems. And we know there have been some attempts to push it back, but there is something new in this conjunction. There is a mutation in neoliberalism, and it's married to authoritarianism, like in Brazil, ultra-nationalism, like in the U.S., Europe, including in Brexit, by the way. Brexit doesn't mean that the UK is abandoning uh, neoliberalism. Religious fundamentalism, like in Turkey, Israel, and India, and so the securitization of the climate crisis, say, through the US military. So neoliberalism today has put on a neo-fascist face. The leading centers of liberal democracy, like the US, including the largest democracies in the global south, like India and Brazil, are experiencing this turn, turn to the extreme right. It is the end of centrist, uh, or center-right neoliberal politics. An extreme right is ascending through ballot boxes in the context of market democracy. This is new. The extreme right and neo-fascism are an outgrowth of neoliberalism and context-specific conditions. Now, when we think of historical fascism, we think about how the left was crushed in the early 20s and 30s. Well, there is no left to crush today, some argue, and I would say that's wrong. We need to be more aware about context and nuance. Well, it would seem precarization today is not enough. Unions are under attack consistently in the United States, in Argentina, in Brazil, around deregulating the labor market, criminalizing the PT, the murder of environmentalists across Latin America, and attacks on dissident academics in India, Turkey, etc. So even a moderate left today that may not be strong 
that may not be powerful is seen as a threat by this extreme right. So democratic space is closing. Sections of the working class, middle classes, plutocratic capitalists, and US imperial power are keeping neoliberalism still on the agenda as it moves to the extreme right. Which brings me to my fourth point, uh, my third point, sorry. Marx did not live long enough to see Soviet socialism, social democracy, and revolutionary nationalism. Samir Amin did, and he also presciently concluded that all three defining projects, left projects of the 20th century, were over based on their limits, even before the hideous degeneration came to the fore. If you read his work, you learn this. In the South African context, National Liberation Project led by the ANC-led alliance is also over and exhausted. It may not seem that the Cyril Foria, the Cyril effect, and some redistributive concessions, etc., coming to the fore, uh, mitigate this perspective. I'm not going to argue the Faustian pact position that the ANC has betrayed all of us this evening, but I am going to pick up on what Manla said about the deficiencies of praxis, practice particularly. Uh, and here I want to make a few points around why we cannot trust the ANC-led alliance going forward. My first point is that 24 years of neoliberalization and deep globalization has placed capitalist accumulation at all costs at the center of the ANC's imagination and practice. It has engendered class forces that will only advance and defend such a trajectory even through looting, and despite this being the most unequal country in the world in income terms. So the Zuma project is an epit epitome of this, and those forces still live inside the ANC alliance. There is no alternative to neoliberal or kleptocratic capitalism in the ANC alliance, which actually makes it anti-left. And both these tendencies are there today, and it is possible that the ANC can move to the extreme right as well, like what's happening in the world. The second point is that it has constructed a market democracy in which credit rating agencies and corporate interests are paramount over citizens. So regulations of banks are not about in the interests of the country, but to ensure they can make more profits. Uh, we're talking about VAT, but we're not talking about corporate tax rates that were over 50% in the early 90s, which are now at 28%, and so on. So it's, it's very, very pro-capital, and in that sense creates a space for proto-fascism. There's an attacking, co-opting, and dividing of the working class. The Marikana massacre, uh, which we are, if you like, remembering today, was the most heinous attack on the working class. If you look at what's happened to Kusatu and the divisions in Kusatu, without a strategic, organized working class would, that's not able to take the strategic initiative, well, I'm sorry, those that are at the center who have these dubious intentions and projects are who are going to prevail. And then, of course, there isn't a serious commitment, uh, rather there's a commitment to carbon and climate capitalism, which is incapable of addressing the climate crisis in a fundamental and systemic way. So I'm saying that the ANC-led alliance does not appreciate the ecocidal logic of contemporary capitalism. And for these reasons, we cannot trust it with the future. <coughs> so, you know, we've got 24 years of a record of practice, uh, and for me, I've reached these conclusions. My first and final points is that Marx understood the need for class struggle, workers' parties, popular resistance to oppression, and the need for internationalism. Samir Amin has been a third worldist, a national, and believed in national popular projects of delinking and internationalism. Both would want us to fight today and to renew the left in a manner to use Samir Amin's words to claim more democracy, not less. The key in this fight is confronting inequality, the climate crisis, and market democracy. All these are connected, but the most dangerous contradiction is the climate contradiction, which can wipe us all out as a species. We are over one degree increase in planetary temperatures since pre-industrial revolution. We are over 400 parts per, per million carbon concentration. We are experiencing the hottest years in the history of the planet right now. And so we have to reject carbon and climate capitalism, capitalist projects as false solutions. It means race, class, and gender struggles have to find solidarities that are programmatic, strategic, and aggregates mass, class, and popular power. So in that sense, I'm resonating with, with what has been said before. But we also have to go beyond shallow intersectionality, which is just about an identitarian politics. We have to build deep solidarities as part of building red, green, anti-oppression alliances. Your struggle is mine, and my struggle is yours. I think this political subjectivity 
has to go beyond the particular and has to be about universals at the same time. Again, I think I'm echoing what has been said. We also need to think creatively about institutional forms, networks, think tanks, movements, citizen-driven people's parties, democratic alternative media, variegated agentic forms of the left. And we have to renew internationalism, and I agree with Mandla. This is very crucial in the context of a battle to sustain life and defend popular or deep democracy. The future for South Africa's left would be determined by alternatives it provides to inequality, the climate crisis, and market democracy. Through renewing socialism as democratic eco-socialism as part of the deep just transition, in my view. It is in this reimagining of socialism we have to even go beyond a Eurocentric modernity and think with the multilinearity of Marx, meaning there are many transitions, we have to think about his conception of ecology, and we have to engage with climate justice forces championing systemic alternatives today when thinking about the transition beyond capitalism. And I think this will also take us to a profoundly decolonizing place. But this is our collective struggle. Thank you. because it's Marxism, but rather because it gives us tools of analysis. And if they don't work anymore, we want to find something that does. So we're trying to rethink. I think we're in a really complicated space as humanity. Um, and I think until recently, we assumed that political democracy was kind of here to stay. We are now in a time where it's not just economic democracy that we don't have, but it's also neo-fascism, authoritarianism. I've just had to do some traveling, and everywhere I went, whether it was Germany, the USA, Brazil, India, I've traveled to these places in the last six months, every single one of them are becoming anti-democratic, and they are silencing voices on the left. So as the left, and as each speaker spoke and mentioned this, we need to find each other, and these differences are inconsequential to what we might face on the horizon as humanity. So, on that happy note, let's find a way to find each other, and let's thank our speakers, um, and I'll see you hopefully on the 19th of September. Is that right, Jane? 19th of September. Thank you very much.